Clarence Whistler, born on February 24, 1856, and passed away on November 6, 1885, was an athlete and Greco-Roman wrestler during the 1880s. He gained fame as the primary competitor of William Muldoon in the early 1880s wrestling scene. Whistler was particularly known for his exceptional strength, high tolerance for pain, and tragically, his premature death. During his life, he engaged in three notable wrestling matches against Muldoon, which collectively lasted over 14 hours. His career began when he was employed at a foundry. His friends, who were impressed by his strength, arranged a match for him in either January 1878 or February 1879 with Lewis Mark. During this encounter, Whistler carried a 1,300-pound iron bar for a distance of 30 feet. He emerged victorious in two straight falls after an hour of wrestling with Mark. Subsequently, Whistler faced Andre Kristall in a four-hour match that concluded in a draw. Kristall then accompanied Whistler on a tour of the Western United States, teaching him the essential techniques of wrestling. In 1881, Whistler's financial backers brought him to New York City to challenge William Muldoon, who had obtained the Greco-Roman Wrestling Championship from Theodore Bauer the previous year. This contest between them lasted 7 hours and 15 minutes, ending in a draw without either wrestler securing a fall. Muldoon alleged that Whistler had applied ammonia to his hair, causing Muldoon's eyes to burn. Additionally, Whistler deliberately kept his fingernails long with the intention of injuring Muldoon. Despite this, Clarence Whistler and William Muldoon formed a touring athletic duo due to public interest in their wrestling match. Muldoon was billed as the Greco-Roman champion. Whistler, the catch-as-catch-can champion. However, personal differences and a dispute over a woman led to a bitter end of their partnership. Whistler spent the following year slandering Muldoon in the press, hoping to provoke a rematch. After several encounters, including a highly anticipated match against Joe Acton, Whistler faced Muldoon again. The result was a draw. Their disagreement over who initiated the draw severed their business partnership permanently. As interest in wrestling declined in California, Muldoon decided to leave for the East. Whistler remained in the West, struggling to attract significant attention to his matches. In an attempt to revive his career, he made the decision to venture into the world of boxing. His foray into boxing was met with resounding defeat. During a prominent event at the old Wigwam Theater in San Francisco in January 1885, Whistler suffered a knockout in the first round at the hands of a local professional boxer. Despite the outcome, Whistler expressed a desire to continue exploring the realm of boxing. Shortly after this, Whistler received an invitation from Professor William Miller. The invitation involved touring Australia as an athlete and wrestler, with the intention of settling the championship question between them at the conclusion of the tour. Whistler accepted the offer. Throughout the tour, Whistler achieved a series of victories and ultimately defeated Miller in September 1885. However, his triumph was short-lived as he engaged in an extravagant month-long celebration resulting in him contracting pneumonia. Tragically, on November 6th, Whistler passed away. Accounts regarding the cause of his untimely death differ. Some sources attribute it to excessive alcohol consumption during the celebration. Others claim it was the result of Whistler biting the tops off champagne bottles for side bets, or even consuming an entire champagne glass. Whistler was laid to rest in the Melbourne General Cemetery, with Miller serving as one of his pallbearers. He was remembered by fellow athletes, including Muldoon, and the sporting community as a whole as one of the most courageous athletes of his era.
Janet Boyer Wolf, also known as Jeanette Wolf, was an American professional wrestler born on June 13, 1933, and passed away on July 28, 1951. She was raised by Billy Wolf and Mildred Burke, acting as her foster parents, and received training from her father, who managed a group of women wrestlers associated with the National Wrestling Alliance. On July 27, 1951, during a match with Ella Waldeck, Wolf was forcefully body slammed on the mat, potentially causing a vein in her stomach to rupture. Later that same evening, while scheduled to participate as a tag team partner with Ava Lee in a benefits show, Wolf began experiencing severe headaches. Despite her discomfort, she wrestled for a short time before collapsing on the ring apron. Wolf received immediate attention, but she remained unconscious. She was swiftly transported to the hospital, where she ultimately passed away at 4 a.m. on July 28th. The official cause of death was determined to be a brain hemorrhage. Medical examination revealed the presence of a blood clot that may have formed several days before. As a result, it was established that Waldick was not responsible for Wolf's demise. Following the incident, Waldeck continued her wrestling career, albeit facing public scrutiny as she was labeled a murderer by the crowd. Waldeck maintained the belief that Wolf's consumption of a large meal between the two matches may have contributed to her tragic death. Arturo Casco Hernandez was born on March 17, 1961. He was a Mexican professional wrestler known by his ring name, La Fiera, meaning the wild beast in Spanish. Throughout his career, La Fiera achieved notable accomplishments. He held the NWA World Welterweight Championship from October 23, 1981, when he defeated Lismark, until July 18, 1982 when he lost the title to Americo Roca. Additionally, he secured the NWA World Middleweight Championship after defeating Gran Amada on November 18, 1984, holding that title until July 20, 1985. As he aged and faced injuries, La Fiera's career slowed down in the 1990s. However, he experienced a modest resurgence in 1996 when he teamed up with Dos Caras and Hector Garza to win the CMLL World Trios Championship. Unfortunately, due to Hector Garza's departure from the promotion, the team had to vacate the title in 1997. La Fiera gradually reduced his wrestling activity and entered semi-retirement by the early 2000s, only participating in a few select dates each year. Hernandez faced personal struggles and drug-related issues towards the end of his life, having previously served a prison sentence in the 1990s for drug dealing. On September 10, 2010, he was stabbed five times during a mugging by an unidentified attacker. Two days later, at the age of 49, Hernandez succumbed to his injuries at a hospital in Mexico City. While it is speculated that his involvement with drugs may have contributed to the attack, the exact motive remains unclear. His killer was never apprehended. Alejandro Perez Jimenez was a Mexican mini Estrella luchador, or midget professional wrestler, primarily known as Esprecto Dos. His twin brother, Alberto, was also a midget professional wrestler who went by the name La Parquita. Alejandro and his twin brother were both victims of a double murder on June 29, 2009. According to reports, the brothers checked into a hotel after a Sunday night show where they encountered two female prostitutes. The women were invited back to their hotel room. 
It's believed that they spiked the wrestlers' drinks with a combination of alcohol and eye drops. The Menace twins passed out, and the women, allegedly associated with their group called La Filtration, robbed them of their belongings, including wallets and cell phones. The drugs added to their drinks resulted in the deaths of the Menace twins. The size of the victims played a role in the fatal outcome. Although typically this method does not lead to death for victims targeted by the women of La Filtration. One of the suspects was arrested on July 22, 2009. The police tracked her down through the use of one of the Jimenez twin cell phones. Although she admitted going to the hotel room with the twins, she denied involvement in their deaths. The second suspect was apprehended on August 12, 2009 in Hidalgo. She admitted being present at the crime scene, but claimed it was her accomplice who administered the fatal drugs. Both women were found guilty and sentenced to 47 years in prison on July 12, 2010. Riki Dozen born Mitsuhiro Momota, was a revered Japanese professional wrestler known as the godfather of pure resu. He achieved national hero status in post-World War II Japan and was one of the country's most famous figures. Sadly, he was stabbed in a Tokyo nightclub on December 8, 1963, and passed away a week later due to peritonitis at the age of 39. Ricky Dozan's impact extended beyond wrestling as he established the Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance, became a successful businessman, and trained future wrestling legends. His matches drew record-breaking ratings. His influence on Japanese wrestling and popular culture during the 1960s was unparalleled. On the evening of December 8, 1963, Riki Dozen was socializing with friends at Tokyo's New Latin Quarter Club, a high-end bar and nightclub. During a conversation with a woman, he became involved in a dispute with Katsushi Murata, a member of the Sumiyoshi Ika, a sub-branch of the Sumiyoshi Kai Yakuza family. Riki Dozen claimed that Murata had stepped on his shoe and demanded an apology but Mirada refused. The argument escalated. Murata drew a knife. Sensing the danger, Riki Dozan quickly attempted to reconcile, apologizing to Murata. Murata declined the apology. Riki Dozan retaliated by punching him, causing him to hit a wall. Riki Dozan then pinned Murata down and continued to strike him until Murata stabbed him once in the abdomen. Murata fled. Riki Dozan sought medical attention at Sanyo Hospital, selecting it due to his acquaintance with one of the doctors, hoping to keep the incident out of the tabloids. The doctor examined the wound and determined it to be non-fatal, but recommended surgery. Upon hearing of the attack, members of the Token Gozai, a gang affiliated with Riki Dozan, found and assaulted Murata, leading to his hospitalization. Riki Dozan underwent a successful surgery but disregarded the doctor's advice and resumed drinking soon after returning home. This caused his condition to worsen. During this time, Murata and his boss visited Riki Dozan at his residence, where the boss apologized and took responsibility for the incident. Riki Dozen forgave him. Due to complications arising from alcohol consumption, Riki Dozen required a second surgery a week later. By this point, he developed parentinitis. He passed away around 9.50 p.m. on December 15, 1963, at the age of 39. This funeral took place on December 20th, 1963. The event drew a massive crowd with over 12,000 attendees that included political, cinematic, and sports figures, 
as well as fans and the general public. Katsushi Murata, the man responsible for the altercation leading to Riki Dozan's death, was convicted of manslaughter in October 1964. He served eight years in prison and was released in 1972. Following his release, Murata made annual visits to Riki Dozan's grave on December 15th. He also apologized to Riki Dozan's sons. In the years that followed, Murata became a high-ranking member of the Yakuza. He passed away on April 9th, 2013, from natural causes. <laughs>